I see that uh, some are coming, uh, uh, but the good news for those who are continuing to come is the only thing that they will miss will be my introduction. Uh, my name is Rod Smith. I direct the Center for Constitutional Studies at Utah Valley University. I want to welcome everyone who's here uh, and who is sharing this day with us. I will uh, begin by introducing Justice Tazdik Hussein Jelani, who has traveled from Pakistan to receive the Center for Constitutional Studies first annual James Madison Award. Immediately after my introduction, we will together watch a video which will highlight the anthem of the Supreme Court of Pakistan, which fittingly was written by our distinguished lecturer today, Justice Jelani. And it is and has long been an inspiration to me. Following uh, that video, we'll be privileged to hear from Justice Jelani as he presents his lecture, The Rule of Law and International Peace. It is an honor, personally and professionally, to introduce Justice Jelani. Justice Jelani attended the Foreman Christian College University in Lahore, Pakistan, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts degree, and he also earned a Master of Science degree in political science. He thereafter uh, earned a Bachelor of Laws degree from Punjab University and became a practicing lawyer and then in time a justice. Uh, he later, on a Higher Education Commission scholarship, completed specialized studies in constitutional law at the Institute of Advanced Studies at London University. He's received multiple honors, far too long. I would take all his speaking time if I went through the honors he's received. I will list but a few. He received a doctorate in humane letters from Southern Virginia University. He received the key of the city of Detroit. He received the American Bar Association Rule of Law Award. He received a fellowship from the University of California at San Diego. And he is an honorary chair of the World Justice Project, together with other notable jurists and world leaders, including some names you might know, President Jimmy Carter. Justices Stephen G. Breyer, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Anthony M. Kennedy of the United States Supreme Court, and former Secretaries of State Madeleine Albright, James Baker, and Colin Powell. Now that's pretty distinguished company. Justice Jelani served as the 21st Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of Pakistan from December of 2013 through July of 2014. He previously served as a Justice of the Supreme Court of Pakistan from 2004 to 2013. And he had previously been nominated to serve as a Justice of the Lahore High Court by Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto in 1994. And I believe he was the youngest justice on one of their regional courts. Justice Delaney's long been a strong proponent of civil liberties and fundamental rights, authoring landmark decisions in controversial cases, including cases dealing with women's rights, honor killings, the right to education. He also authored a decision protecting minority religious sects and religious liberty after the Peshawar church attack in 2013. 
The decision remains the broadest interpretation of religious freedom uh, under the Constitution of Pakistan. Just last week, on October 12th, Justice Jelani was nominated to serve as a judge ad hoc on the International Court of Justice, which is commonly referred to as the World Court. He will be involved in a hearing involving India and Pakistan, a hearing of great significance. That nomination is further evidence of the international respect for Justice Jelani as a jurist committed to justice, fairness, and the rule of law. Now, may I indulge you just a moment longer and conclude with a few personal remarks. Our honored guest and lecturer is the most courageous jurist I have ever met. He is a great defender of the rule of law. He is, as anyone who knows him, a wonderfully decent human being and a friend. Just one quick illustration of this great man. We were going to dinner on Saturday night. We could have indicated who was with us, but he insisted we not do that, so we had to wait much longer for a table. My name does not carry near the weight that Justice Jelani does. It's a personal and professional honor, therefore, as director of the Center for Constitutional Studies to present Justice Test Hussein Jelani with the James Madison Award of Merit for his commitment to conscience and the constitutional rule of law. What we give in this award are, this was minted in 1993. These are two uh, gold $5 pieces, two silver dollar pieces, and two silver 50 cent pieces. This is a limited edition it recognizes the 200th bicentennial of the Bill of Rights. Uh, and that, he'll get a certificate and some other things too, but that is primary award. And I'm writing a book about James Madison. And Justice Jelani, as I said, years ago in the Supreme Court, there at the Supreme Court in Pakistan, and watched as you and your fellow justices stood for the constitutional rule of law. I thought, oh my, a latter day Madison. So, we will watch together the video. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. And then we'll get to hear from Justice Jelani, a latter-day James Madison. Just this 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for being here this afternoon. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, Center for Constitutional Studies, for having me here. And thank you for your very, very kind introduction. It's a day of great honor for me. I'm honored to be the first recipient of Ma James Madison Award and the first to deliver lecture under the James Madison Lecture Series. I'm honored to be in this historic city of Utah, a monument valley known for its natural beauty, its en enchanting sunrises, mm -hmm. its fascinating sunsets, and its artistic mix of red soil against the blue sky. But this land is also famous for a more significant reason. Two centuries ago, Brigham Young and his fellow members of the Church of Jesus and Christ of Latter-day Saints arrived here and called it home. This touch of faith in the valley is a reminder of one universal law of peace that binds people of all faiths and no faiths together. It exists in every set of Christianity and Judaism, in Islam and Hinduism, in Buddhism and humanism. We know it as the golden rule, that is, the call to treat one another as we would wish to be treated, the call to love and the call to serve. To do what we can, in the life of those with whom we share the same brief moment on earth. Had humanity reflected over this role during the grand sweep of history, we may have had far less war than peace. And it is also my privilege to be addressing in particular this university, a most dynamic house of learning, though I must admit that I thought long and hard about how best to put forth the subject that brings me here. I've been asked to speak on the rule of law and international peace. This subject is particularly relevant to such a setting because universities are a principal player in a global system increasingly driven by knowledge, information, and ideas. Universities are a catalyst for change and progress. Victories are gained, peace is preserved, progress is achieved, and civilization is built up not in the battlefield where ghastly murders are committed in the name of patriotism, not in parliaments where insipid speeches are spun out in the name of debate, but in educational institutions which are the seed beds of culture where boys and girls in whose hands lie the destinies of the future are trained. From them will emerge when they come of age, statesmen, visionaries, leaders and citizens committed to the nation and to the world at large. It is such leaders of thought and action on whom I pin my hope for a world without war. You are the future and by being so, the preceding generations place a sacred trust 
in your hands. Since the dawn of history, humans have longed for peace, but gone to war for a variety of reasons, more often than not for land, gold, or religion. A sustained peace st still remains elusive. But what is peace? What generates discontent, discord, tension, and conflict among people and states that leads to war? A few years back, I was invited to Michigan to speak on the imperatives of peace in the New World Order. While speaking about peace, I said, and I quote, when I talk of peace, I mean a state of existence which makes the life on earth worthy of human beings, a quality of life where people can grow and prosper, where people can live in peace and pursue a life free from hunger, want, disease, where children can pursue their studies without the crippling effect of fear, violence, war, malnutrition, and an insecure future." Unquote. This, ladies and gentlemen, is my vision of peace. During the last few decades, the pace of human progress has surpassed all stages in human history. Global trade and economy have expanded and lifted millions of people out of poverty. Despite the phenomenal progress made, naked pursuit of power and influence in disregard to the rule of law continues to be the main driving force in politics among nations. This has led to a number of issues which are potential threats to world peace. Some of those issues are the Palestinian issue, the Syrian crisis, the crisis in Afghanistan, the collapse of Central African Republic causing displacement of 400,000 persons, the Iran-US and North Korea-US tensions, disputes in East China Sea, issues related to cross-border migration, the Kashmir issue, which has led to three wars between India and Pakistan, both of which are nuclear powers today, the impunity of ethnic cleansing of Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, and the unprecedented urbanization in the last decade, which too is a challenge to global security, and last but not the least, terrorism. The global inequality and poverty have uh, been further confounded. According to an estimate, almost half of the people live, live on less than $2 a day. A billion people live on less than a dollar a day a woman dies every minute in childbirth. There are serious issues of human rights violations, of environmental degradation, of pollution, of global warming. People in some regions of the world suffer with serious diseases which are beyond their capacity to treat, to treat without international help. Notwithstanding this poverty. The countries have spent trillions of dollars and are spending on armaments. According to Jane's budget, defense budget report, US last year spent $622 billion on arms. China. $191 billion, UK $53 billion, and according to the same report, the total spending of countries on armed equipment is going to be $233 billion in the year 2020. These trillions of dollars could have been diverted to alleviating human suffering poverty and disease, but for the absence of the rule of law. 
Although the UN has an impressive record in socio-economic domain, but on political issues, it has a long way to go. The Security Council attempts to prevent conflict and wars, pass strongly worded resolutions, but mostly those are not heeded. Permanent solutions remain beyond reach. Sadly enough, the issues are allowed to fester at the uh, uh, altar of power politics. Those who possess veto powers can effectively scuttle any solution which is against their perceived national interest. They justify power politics on the ground that it leads to world peace. But has such balance of power brought a state of peace around the world? Hasn't this power politics and absence of the rule of law rendered UN rather toothless? Can territorial disputes be amicably resolved merely by power? Can this approach settle the issues of conflicting mindset and divergent worldviews? Can terrorism be eliminated by the use of hard power alone? Can UN be vested with the power to make law against war and have it enforced through paramilitary force on the pattern of domestic enforcement of law? Historically, the evolution of rules and discipline of international law has emerged through great wars. Modern international law first took shape in 1625 during the Thirty Years' War when Hugo Grotius, a Dutch diplomat, produced his monumental work titled as On the Law of War and Peace. With numerous states being released from authority of the Pope and Emperor, Grotius feared there would be little restraint among them and lawlessness would prevail. He believed, and I quote, where judicial settlement ends, war begins, unquote. To avoid this, he created a set of principles for the newly states to obey in their dealings with e each other. That was the beginning of the modern international law. During the Second World War, another renowned academic, Hans, Professor Hans Kelsen, propounded his famous theory of international peace through law and said, I quote, the idea of law in spite of everything seems still to be stronger than any ideology of power, unquote. Immediately after the Second World War, the UN was created, the Security Council and International Court of Justice were created through the Charter. The declared objectives of the Charter were maintaining worldwide peace and security, fostering cooperation between nations in order to solve social and humanitarian problems. The concept of rule of law is embedded in the Charter of the United Nations. The Security Council has the primary responsibility under the UN Charter for the maintenance of international peace and security. It is for the Security Council to determine when and where US keep, uh, keep, uh, peacekeeping operations should be deployed. Although there is no international legislature to enact laws or make rules, the nations mostly comply with international law because they make the rules to suit themselves. Most potent of all reasons for compliance by states with international law is the sheer necessity of doing so. The point was aptly made by Douglas Hurd, who said, and I quote, nation states are incompetent. None of them, not even the United States, as the single remaining superpower can adequately provide for the needs that its citizens now articulate. The extent of that incompetence 
has become sharply clearer during this century. The inadequacy of national governments to provide security, prosperity, or a decent environment has brought into being a huge array of international rules, conferences, and institutions. The only answer to the puzzle of the immortal but incompetent nation state is effective cooperation between those states for all the purposes that lie beyond the reach of any one of them." Unquote. International law is not merely a set of moral rules. The development of international law has followed the development of common and customary law, which ultimately led to the enactment of formal law. In the realm of international relations, Treaties are honored because the states, through ratification, accord solemn commitment to comply with those. Indeed, in the world of globalized interdependence, the relationship between national and international law, substantially and procedurally, is such that the rule of law cannot be regarded as applicable on one plane, but not on the other. There are some main practice areas where issues of international law may arise even in national courts. What are those areas? Those are aviation law, commercial law, intellectual property law, criminal law, human rights law, immigration, and finally, warfare and weapons law. The track record of UN in enforcing the rule of law and preventing armed conflict has been a mixed bag. The charter clearly mandates that except in self-defense, force may be used if only if authorized by the Security Council but not otherwise. Unilateral resort to war is replaced by a collective decision making on behalf of the member states. In his report, titled as Uniting Our Strength, Enhancing United Nations Support for the Rule of Law, the UN Secretary General classified the rule of law related activities of the UN into three main baskets. Those baskets are, first, the rule of law at international level. The second is the rule of law in the, in the context of conflict and post-conflict situations. And the third is the rule of law in the context of long-term development. The first basket corresponds to the rule of law internationalized, while the second and the third basket match with internalization of the rule of law. As for the first basket is concerned, the UN does not seem to have gone much further than repeating evidences such as the need to develop and respect international law and to resort to international dispute resolution mechanism and to the International Court of Justice in particular. On the contrary, the second and third baskets seem to receive more concrete attention at the UN as the Secretariat is engaged in a thorough reflection on the various ways to coordinate UN actions on the field so as to promote the rule of law domestically through, for example, peacekeeping and peace building activities and programs, reconciliation processes and the design of viable and effective judicial systems. The United Nations Development Program has been helpful to empower and build nations in post-conflict situations. Some of the countries where UNDP has established the rule of law and contributed to development are Kyrgyzstan, Latveria, Mali, Lebanon, Ukraine, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Afghanistan, Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, Nepal, and Yemen. 
Despite the modest record of UN in peacekeeping, most transactions between states governed by international law proceed smoothly and routinely on the strength of the known and accepted principles of international law. But the regional conflicts, non-resolution of politically explosive disputes between states and the unabated arm race are not only reflective of certain deficiencies of the rule of law regime, but also a culture of impunity having must multiple facets. What are those deficiencies in the rule of law? First is the temptation of some states to rewrite the rules. Although the UN has averted the Third World War, but it failed to remain effective in certain situations. For instance, after the Second World War, the first major crisis was the Swiss crisis, and the UK rewrote its, uh, the, the, the rules by misinterpreting the P independence agreement with Egypt. Then after the Great War, till now, the U.S. has been involved in some 49 military actions, including war in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yugoslavia, regime change invasions in Grenada, Panama, Haiti, military assistance to rebel groups in Angola, Ali Salvador, Nicaragua, and missile attacks in Lebanon, Libya, Yemen, and Sudan. Of these, by far, the most contentious was the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 2003. On such issues, the U.N. did pass resolutions, but their enforcement remained hostage to cooperation between the members of the Security Council. The second weakness of the rule of law at international level is the account, it relates to the accountability and the, uh, accountability. The modern definitions of the rule of law imply that all persons must be accountable to the rule of law, that is to face social and legal consequences of having violated the law. Indeed, if the rule of law is to have any real social function, the social actors must have the obligation to abide by it, and society must be able to hold them accountable. From the public international point of view, the International Court of Justice is the only jurisdiction with general competence over issues of international law. However, it has two basic limitations. It lacks compulsory jurisdiction, and secondly, it is confined only to civil disputes. The third weakness in the international rule of law regime is the absence of an effective mechanism to try crimes against humanity. One mode could have been conferral of universal jurisdiction on domestic courts, but there is no consensus on that. By universal jurisdiction is meant the jurisdiction of a national court to try a person irrespective of his nationality or place of occurrence who is accused of an international crime. Some of those crimes are war crimes, genocide, torture, forcible disappearance of a person are crimes against humanity. Eleven countries, nevertheless, have conferred universal jurisdiction on domestic courts, including United Kingdom and Canada. The first court to, such, to try such offenses was established immediately after the Second World War. The United States inspired the world when it proclaimed at Nuremberg and elsewhere that aggression, genocide, and other crimes against humanity were universally prohibited by international law. It was recognized that states can act only through individuals, and thus those leaders responsible for the crimes 
could be held accountable in a court of law. The Nuremberg Principles were affirmed by the United Nations in 1946 and became binding legal, legal precedents of a war crime in trials in Tokyo and elsewhere. Subsequently, the UN committees made abortive attempt to arrive on an agreed code of crimes against humanity. However, the, these efforts failed because of the Cold War and power politics among the major powers. In the last few decades, new modes of enforcement of international law of crimes against humanity were devised, and five international tribunals were constituted. Those are, the firstly, the military tribunal uh, at Nuremberg. The second is the Tokyo Military Tribunal for Far East. The third was the International Criminal Court for former Yugoslavia. And fourth was the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And finally, the Statute of International Criminal Court adopted by an affirmative vote of 120 states at a conference convened by the United Nations. In the contemporary age, the need for an appropriate tribunal exercising universal jurisdiction cannot be overemphasized. In the last half a century, in several African and Latin American countries, crimes against humanity have been committed with impunity. This was accompanied by mass repression and murder. These crimes went unpunished because of the absence of an effective international system of accountability. The world we live in is so interconnected that anything which happens beyond our borders impacts us and vice versa, be it war, terrorism, poverty, recession, environmental pollution or disease. We have stakes in the planet we live in, in its peace, in its progress. We have stakes in building a social consensus and an international civil society. To be fair to the United States, at a certain stage of history, it did play a role in, its, in it, his attempt to create an international civil society and a rule-based world. As rightly remarked by the Economist magazine, and I quote, by backing global institutions that staves off a dog-eat-and-dog dog world, the United States has made itself and the world safer and more prosperous." Unquote. You did so because this has been part of your creed, part of your ethos, which is beautifully articulated in your Declaration of Independence when you declared 200 years ago, and I quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, unquote. You welcome the world to this promised land through a loud call engraved on the Statute of Liberty. It's a beautiful poem, which I partly quote, is goes on to say, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming show. Send these, the homeless tempest toes to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door, unquote. This is what made America respected, and not merely, merely its arsenal. It was respected for its openness, for its diversity, for its research and innovation, for its universities, for its respect for every faith, and for its respect for universal values. 
that element on American exceptionalism, ladies and gentlemen, is under serious threat today. And this strikes a discordant note. The lack of US participation in multilateral initiatives has undermined the global security and progress towards social justice and environmental protection. We need to realize that populism is a blow to civic nationalism, and it's a negation not only of universal values the US has espoused, but also of the rule of law. If this element, rather aberration in national politics, remain untampered by people's collective conscience, the country may further weaken its claim for moral leadership of the free world. For a lasting peace, may reliance on UN Charter may not be enough because peace does not rest in the charters and covenants alone. It lies in the hearts and minds of people. So let's rest, so let's not rest all our hopes on parchment and on paper. Let's strive to build peace, a desire for peace, a willingness to work for peace in the hearts and minds of people. In the ultimate end, the abolition of war, the maintenance of peace, the ad adjustment of international questions by peaceful means will come through the force of public opinion which controls nations. War begins in the minds of men. And it is in the minds of men that defenses to peace be constructed. So ordains the Charter of the United Nations. Armed conflicts, violence, and terrorism would continue to cause human misery unless it ends in the minds of men. It is in the minds that change has to come if we want to live in peace with others. That can only happen through quality education, real knowledge of the other, and understanding of diversity, which is the most precious resource a person can have. Mercifully, the right to education has been declared a fundamental right by UNESCO. A special curricula has to be framed, which would equip the children with the knowledge to come to terms with the world, a world inhibited by people having different faiths and ethnic identities. One of the fundamental aims of education should be to encourage thoughts and traits which inspire feelings of common humanity, that is, humane temper, tolerance, social courage, integrity, pursuit of truth, and a sense of history. Such an education would produce global citizens capable and competent to heal global wounds. Without promotion of such virtues, it would be difficult to achieve understanding among nations. This would help in evolving an international society which would not only be supportive of enacting a global law, but would also nurture and sustain it. Dear friends, Social political revolutions take time to happen. But you don't have to wait that long. You can make a start today with a basic understanding of your role as citizens. International peace starts with local peace. Peace in my home, in your home. If you want to achieve peace, we must make a difference with humans around us. You start the day with the intention to spread kindness to anyone you come across, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, gender, political affiliation, or language. Imagine what such gestures of kindness could do. As citizens in a democracy, you hold an enormous office which makes you equal irrespective of your career or vocation, 
in life, be it a teacher, a doctor, an engineer, an agriculturist, industrialist, a civil servant, a father and a mother, or a son or a daughter. You are members of one race of human beings, notwithstanding your social or political or religious affiliation, as part of that one race and living in a world of interconnectivity, you can't be indifferent to public affairs, both domestic and international. I've always believed that hope has been one of the greatest driving forces in human history. Let no one be discouraged by the belief that there is nothing one man or a woman can do against the enormous array of world's ills, against misery and ignorance, injustice and violence. Few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each one of us can work to change a small portion of events, and in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. It is from the numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history, his, history is shaped. Each time a man and a woman stands up for an ideal, our acts to improve the lot of others, our strikes out against injustice, he or she sends a tight, tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples will build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Only with this spirit and passion, we can make it, the world around us a better place to live. But before I part, with you. You may like to remind yourself of the last message which your founding father, George Washington, gave to the nation. He said, and I quote, observe good faith and justice towards all nations. Cultivate peace and harmony with all. Religion and morality enjoin this conduct. Can it be that good policy does not equally enjoin it? It will be worthy of a free, enlightened, and at no distant period a great nation mm -hmm. to give to mankind the magnanimous and not too novel example of a people always guided by exalted justice and bene benevolence." Unquote. With this message and hope, ladies and gentlemen, I take your leave by thanking you once again. Thank you. I'm happy to respond to any question which uh, anyone may have. Well, I'll warm everyone up <laughs> with one. Uh, we, we had a former uh, chief, the director of the CIA, and the chairman of the National Security Council here on campus in the last 10 days. He, he spoke, just as you spoke, uh, at this sort of micro level building piece. He spoke that the nation states are living in the most complicated world they ever had because it is these disruptive subnational organizations and so forth, the terrorists, the other kinds of organizations that pose a threat. I wonder, 
uh, if perhaps that might itself, ju just as building individually to build peace, but those disruptions of uh, terrorists and other organizations that are subnational might help contribute to bringing nations themselves to seek a rule of law. Because the one thing those subgroups don't abide is a rule of law. What what is your thought of that world where we just where old the old map he showed of the map after the Second World War, both nations have disintegrated. We have we have multiple nations, your own nation after what do you think? Is there any chance that maybe those disrupting forces that are attacking Pakistan and the United States at the same time might bring us together as nations? Well, uh, after the Second World War, uh, there was collapse of several colonial powers and independent states emerged. Then the USSR collapsed and then we have the phenomenon of uh, non-state actors which have created terror in various parts of the world. I tend to agree with your learned speaker who came to visit this university that these forces of terror should persuade us to come to one platform forged to fight this terrorism and other forces which are disrupting international peace. But I believe for that to happen, broadly, two measures are necessary. One is an agreement among states through the instrumentality of United Nations to agree on a common agenda to confront this menace. And the other is the long-term plan for social reformation through education, which I have alluded to in my presentation. This, to my mind, uh, uh, can be, broadly speaking, two measures which are required to be taken. Well, is that a question? Please. <clears throat> so here in the United States, our president feels that the United States has been carrying a great burden in trying to bring peace and prosperity, security to the entire world, and seems to be trying to push back to encourage other countries to carry their share of the burden. Would you comment on how you feel about um, this uh, tide that seems to be afoot here in the United States of America first? Well, uh, as I mentioned, one of the golden elements of American exceptionalism has been their respect for universal values and their vision of a world where they have a role to play. US, after the First World War, fo followed a policy of isolationism. But it had to abandon it in the Second World War and for the first time used the atomic power 
in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Why? Because we are living in a world where you can't remain aloof. A power like United States has stakes in the world. The U.S. has stakes in having nuclear non-proliferation. U.N. has stakes in having a deal with Iraq, Iran. UN, uh, U.S. has stakes in remaining within the uh, Kyoto Protocol. I think it would be highly myopic if uh, U.S. comes out of these uh, multilateral initiatives and agreements. But I find that Trump is not consistent on some of these issues. He makes a statement, and on the other, his uh, Secretary of State gives a, a different statement. For instance, on the Iran uh, nuclear deal, Trump said something different. But the uh, Secretary of Defense came out with a different explanation, which is uh, in favor of remaining and protecting the deal. So I think, uh, ultimately, uh, your president uh, uh, would be uh, forced to uh, follow a more pragmatic policy uh, and uh, uh, retain U.S. role in the world affairs. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Please. Yes, please. Uh, so according to Pew, um, roughly 77% of Pakistani citizens see the United States as an enemy. So in your opinion, what does the United States need to do in order to bridge the relationship between the Middle East and the United States itself? 70% of? Yeah, 77 for, according to Pew Research Center in 2012, 77% of Pakistani citizens see the United States as an enemy of sorts. Well, uh, I'm not sure about the percentage, but uh, there has been criticism of U.S. policies. But there has also been a praise for the American values, for its democracy, for its freedom, and the very fact that uh, in all the el uh, elections we have had, we voted for those liberal political parties which stood for friendship with US and the West shows that the broad majority who matter in politics are in favor of having a equation with the United States. Why? Because, number one, I said that U.S. stands for a free world, for a democratic world. Number two, I believe that no major power in the world has spent so much in reconstruction and development of other countries as U.S. has done particularly after the Second World War. Look at the Marshall Plan. And number three, uh, most of our uh, Pakistanis who are serving as doctors and engineers, they enjoy respect and recognition in this society. And they strongly love this country because they have rights in, the, in this country which uh, uh, some of the Muslim countries don't uh, give to their own citizens. So it's a misnomer that uh, the 70% uh, the uh, people don't approve of uh, relations with US. 
most of the governments that we have had, elected governments I'm talking about, they were pro-US. You? I like what you said about <clears throat> our position as a country when it came to genocide, post, which was much different post-World War II than it is today. I'm curious to know your opinion on it. Our position on genocide, it's almost as if, in a lot of ways, we stand on the sideline. If we weren't on the sideline as much, how would that affect member states in the UN? Someone. Could you be a little more uh, explicit in your question? <laughs> Place like Darfur. It is like? Darfur. Where it goes on, it's gone on forever. And a great power like the United States would do nothing. Yes, that's what I was trying to say, that you have, U.S. has a role to play in such situations. It has a global responsibility. How would it affect some of the other member states? In a positive way? Absolutely. You see, U.S. acted in a very positive way in uh, Yugoslavia, Herzegovina. We can't forget that. Right. And uh, in other uh, 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 through its soft power, it is uh, investing so much. For instance, the charities, the Bill Gates, what he, he is doing in Africa, that's a tremendous work. And in our country, such individuals are highly respected and talked about. What your soft power is doing, your hard power is not in terms of uh, winning the hearts and minds of people. Yes, please. Uh, could you s repeat the question again? I have the opportunity to homeschool my children and educating them at home. At home? At home. Okay. Instead of in the public school system. What do you feel is the most important thing that I can teach them? Well, you must teach them the basic human values. You must teach them that they are people of different faiths and we must respect them. You must treat them, teach them the virtues of truth, courage, and standing for a right cause. I think these are the moral values that you must impart your children. Besides the uh, other, you know, uh, subjects that you would like to teach them to make them useful citizens, you must teach these social values. Yes, please. That's it's a very big question. <laughs> I think it would take a couple of hours to answer this. And uh, 
maybe uh, uh, I think the best uh, thing for U.S. is to strengthen the United Nations. To strengthen the United Nations and to enforce the rule of law. Once a superpower like United States complies with the rule of law, other countries would follow. This would have a demonstration effect. If a superpower flouts the rule of law, the other, other countries will also follow. You see, imagine $622 billion being spent on armament. Imagine if this money had been spent on alleviating human suffering. What would happen? I mean, the amount of soft power that you have and what role it can perform in changing the world, no nation in human history had this power. Make use of this power, this soft power. And your dream of moral leadership of the world would come true. You see, uh, socially, I find the Americans most friendly in the world. But when it comes to politics, it's a different ball game. So I would say that you, uh, you, I mean, America created United Nations. It played a deep pivotal role. America constituted the first court to try crimes against humanity, the Nuremberg Trials. Who wrote the Charter of United Nations? America wrote the Charter of United Nations. Where UN is housed, it's housed in the US. So it's, it has a global responsibility to strengthen this organization, and that's the only way you can have peace around the world. Uh, well, I think it's a very hard question to respond to, particularly uh, even uh, the U.S. administration has not been able to decide uh, what to do, because uh, you have uh, uh, an insane person ruling North Korea, and it has nuclear power. So uh, I think, uh, I mean, I'm not uh, aware of the uh, background diplomacy, uh, background uh, talks which are going on. But I think uh, uh, one good thing that this tension between US and North Korea has come about is the closeness of China and America on this point. I think the best thing would be to promote this equation and take some collab collaborative measure along with China and Russia to confront the situation. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want people to have an opportunity to come and meet uh, Justice Jelani. I do want to say something given the number of students that are here. I sat in 1970 at the University of California in the classroom. And they talked, we had one professor after another come in and talk about the end of the world. 
by 1984. Environmentally, the wars. And I looked around and everyone was deeply distraught. And it came to me as an epiphany that I'm going to believe from this day forward there's hope. And if in the end I'm wrong, I'll at least say I had a better ride than everybody else with these dour faces. But what happened along the way? From a little, small, rural town, essentially in Nevada, to Pakistan, to Hungary, to Poland, all over, to Jamaica, all over this world. I have come to find people of the stature of justice so hard. Don't believe for a moment there's not hope through soft peace. And there we can begin. And I think if we do that, as is so often the case, the rule of law will fall. I just want you to know, and I'm going to be sentimental, and hardly British, but quite American. I love this man for what he's done to my grandchildren. Thank you. Our latest James Madison, our first James Madison <laughs> award. Thank you. I'll bet you he would like you if you want to take a picture.